Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out those wings and slither in place because this is is Snakebirds. Welcome Snakebirds to another episode of the podcast. We're back with another deep dive into the scrum of Supernatural in our new segment titled Weird in the Word. That's right, guys. We're super excited to get into our second edition of this cool new direction we're going with Weird and Wacky. And uh, we're going to be talking about a very unique place in Scripture with um, an angry old man, some she-bears, and just really a grisly event. (laughs) Oh, I like it. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to get into another weird Scripture. That's right. Yeah. And we uh, we say this now with this new segment, if it's weird, it's worthy of discussion. And we realize that some of the things that we talk about, you're like, why is that weird? Well, it's weird to us and somebody might have submitted it as weird. And we figure um, it just gets us talking about things in the Bible. Yeah. We've got a profile segment that we do. We've got other segments that we're doing. And now weird in the word is just going to enter into the rotation. Yeah. We might have just crossed the threshold of somebody normal. So, you know, <laughs> we're trying to reach all people here. <laughs> Everyone's weird is something different than everyone else. They're like, you think that's weird? You should see my weird. <laughs> Don't look at my search history. <laughs> Why do I use that voice? Oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. So we hope you're on board and excited to get into another weird one. Yeah. And our weird today is a doozy. Um, and me being partially follically challenged, this one's always been close to my heart. <laughs> and uh, I've titled it Elisha and the She Bears, which is also my new favorite band name. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a fantastic band Wouldn't name. Wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. yeah. You need a, I don't know. Would it be like you had to have female backup, like band backup? Probably. The She Bears. I don't know if anybody would just be like, I'm a she bear. I had I had a friend in high school who started a band called Mr. Junebug and the Friday Night Porsche Lights. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. In the she bears one just yeah. reminded me of it. <laughs> okay. Wow. I anyway, like it. Yeah. yeah. Great band name. So. Okay. So uh, this story takes place in 2 Kings chapter 2. And let me give you a little bit of the background on it. Elisha. Remember, we're going to talk about Elijah and Elisha, and those names are easily uh, confused or easily um, flipped. And so Elisha, we can always call him the Jedi Padawan, and Elijah is the Jedi Master. Well, Elisha, the Padawan, has just witnessed the ascension to heaven of his master slash mentor, Elijah. And he quite literally takes up the mantle because he picks up his robe, his cloak that his master used, and he takes up the mantle of becoming Israel's next great prophet. And he returns to his home base in Jericho and gets right to work, starting off his solo ministry with some miracles. Uh, To reference one in particular, he purifies a whole town's bad water supply by having people put salt in it from a new bowl. And there was... I don't know. I just like reading on stuff like this. It said there's some significance of saying it's a new bowl. It's a new work. It's like new wine skins. And I thought that was really neat, but that's not the weird we're talking about tonight because right in the next few verses, it says from Jericho, he takes about a 14 mile road trip to the idol worshiping town of Bethel. And along the way, well, let's let the verses tell the story and then we'll discuss it. Let me read Second Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. I'm reading out of the New King James, even though I'm going to highlight a section in both the New Living Translation and the message. Verse 23. Then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head! I had to give that emphasis on it. <laughs> I love what the New Living Translation says. It says, go away, baldy. They chanted, go away, baldy. And I just had like, (laughs) maybe they have this like cadence of saying it. Or the message says it like this. What's up, you old bald head? Out of our way, skinhead. Oh my gosh, they (laughs) they went really derogatory there. Yeah, they did. Uh, Verse 24. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Verse 25. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel and he returned to Samaria. 
Needless to say, this is a story that I've read multiple times, and it feels like it's got a lot of weird in it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> like a lot of Bible stories I've read, I can't help but say that I've made a little bit of a movie in my head of what I think this looked like. But on further review, my movie, and I'm put this in air quotes, my mind movie might be more Hollywood fiction and not as historically accurate as I initially thought. <laughs> so if you're okay with it, Stephen, I'd like to give you a firsthand description at the script for the movie in my mind. And then uh, like the good Bible detectives that we strive to be, work backward and fix some of these inaccuracies. Sounds good. Set the stage for us. Okay. So picture this. This is my opening shot. We fade up from black on an old man lumbering down a deserted path. I need my movie trailer voice for this. Uh, off in the distance is a group of several small boys aged 8 to 14 throwing pine cones at each other and roughhousing. As they begin to notice the older man's limp and his extreme lack of hair, one boy begins to laugh, and then another. And soon there's a chorus of laughter as these school-aged children hoot and holler because of this man's lack of dome coverage. Just then a shrill, mocking voice rings out through the laughter. You're bald! Get up, baldy! As the chants begin to grow louder, crueler, and more ridiculous, the old man turns and lifts up his head just enough to make eye contact. He mumbles something under his breath. Suddenly, bursting from the tree line, come two savaged female bears with fury in their eyes and blood on their breath as they mercilessly kill and maim 42 of these tiny boys. With a shrug and a sigh, the old man slowly turned and continued on his way to the town of Bethel. So, okay. <laughs> you did that pretty well, bro. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so you've heard the assumed movie in my head. Now we can break it down and show that uh, even with my 20 or 30 times of reading this passage throughout my life, I've really added some Hollywood magic and gotten a portion of these facts wrong. Do you agree? Yeah, there's there's a lot in there that that I pictured kind of the same way. And as I got into this study, yeah, there's a few points that I would say might need a little altering. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is, I've like I said, I've read this so many times, and um, even at first read. I think this is one of those stories that people who don't understand the Bible can look at and point to and make fun of God. True. Because it sounds like God just allowed these two female bears to murder a bunch of children. Yeah. And it does sound that way. It does. I've seen people use this scripture to, to say, that's the God you serve. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I've seen Christians come to it and not know what in the world to think of it. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of different takes on it you could have. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets really offensive because you're like, well, I want to defend God based on the culture and talk about why my movie, as cool as it might be in my movie trailer voice, yeah, it actually is inaccurate. <laughs> so let's... Um, Start from the top. Uh, first and foremost, Bethel, which is sad because it actually means house of God. Yeah. And the name came from when Jacob uh, was dwelling and it, it was like right near the Jacob's ladder. And it was like, this shall be called the house of God because God dwells here. And it's gone from that. It's strayed from that because now it's an idolatrous city. Yes. And it's a center for idol worship in the land. So people come from all over. It's like a hub city of idol worship. Yeah, that's true. And as I was kind of preparing the backstory for myself, looking at all this, I, I saw that uh, a couple different scholars were pointing to the fact that, that, that the beginning of the chapter, they're really setting up Bethel as the target here mm -hmm. because they're making a few, a few points. One of them that I found interesting was um, Michael Heiser says this about the dilemma. He says the directional phrase going down to Gilgal or from Gilgal to Bethel in the actual geography is not possible because Bethel is higher than Gilgal. It's actually reversed in terms of real geography. And I saw that some scholars have always kind of just written it off as a sloppy thing that scribes did mm -hmm. or whatever, but they said it's actually a point they were making to, to put Bethel as a target. Oh, wow. Um, one uh, scholar, Burnett, says this, not only do the place names mentioned in this text correspond to known historical geography, but they also play significant roles elsewhere in the passage's later literary context of Deuteronomy through Second Kings. 
The theological geography of these books, known collectively as the Deuteronomistic history, reserves a special place of scorn for Bethel, which stands in opposition to Jerusalem's unique status upon its founding as the one place where Yahweh will cause his name to dwell. So, essentially, we're seeing an intentional wording setting up Bethel as the target, because um, as that article continued, it was a place where opposing religious people would describe as a high place, saying going up to worship mm. at Bethel. And here the scripture says going down to Bethel. Wow. So it was them saying, it was throwing a, a slap shot at yeah. them saying, we're going down. Well, that's interesting because they talk about in scripture that all the high places were made into places of worship. But yeah. if they're saying we're going down to it, then it's trying to it was physically mi- belittle it. Or Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I found that interesting. Hmm. That's really cool. Okay. So right away, we come to a couple of my inaccuracies. One of the first things is that these boys, of course, came out of Bethel. Uh, or Bethel, and we need to talk about um, what this means. So first of all, they're called little Mm -hmm. in the story. It says that a group of little youths or or small, and the word in the Hebrew is katan, and that means small, insignificant, unimportant, young, or lesser. And there's a connotation here that these kids, these children actually weren't children at all. They were actually young men who just weren't committed to a profession yet. Mm. And so this little word means like insignificant, unimportant, because they hadn't walked into a physical profession yet. And then the next word that we find in the Hebrew is na'er, which means lad or young man. And this term... Uh, was used for use in the Bible all the way from like <laughs> like a toddler age all the way up to over 30 years old. Yes. So this this term applied to Joseph when he was 39. Yeah. Uh, this term applied to Isaac when he was 28, to David when he was 16 years old, and to Solomon when he was 20. Yeah. I saw I saw Joseph as seventeen for this word too, so I, I guess there could have been a couple spots that he was referred to as Naar. Yeah, and um, I also saw David at the age that he slew Goliath was called that too. Mm-hmm. So someone who could fight in battle. I mean, we're not talking about a little kid. No, responsible for their actions. Yeah, and one scholar actually said this about Naar is. The term Na'ar is applied to an unmarried male who has not yet become the head of a household. There you go. Na'ar is not a little child. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah. Another commentary says refers to men from age 12 to 30 years old who were able to discern right from wrong and make their own decisions. This was not a group of playful children making a clever joke, but a group of smart aleck young men maliciously ridiculing God and God's servants. And then MacArthur, our favorite, (laughs) said, these were not children, but infidels and idolatrous young men in the late teens or 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually found one more word that they used to describe these kids was Yeladim. And uh, Dr. Burnett points out that the word Yeladim is used twice in 1 Kings 12 as the sole designation for Rehoboam's younger advisors. Also throughout the Hebrew Bible, the same term is used for young adult males with royal associations. Mm. And then he also says this, quote, Accordingly, the group of males who confront Elisha in 2 Kings 2.2, far from being little children are young men of the royal and perhaps priestly establishment at Bethel. Against this group of young men, Elisha pronounces a fatal curse in the name of Yahweh. The number of them killed, 42, is also the number of young men of Judean royalty and with connections to the house of Omri, who Jehu slaughters in later in the mm. later narrative. So we see that that these are not children at all. No. And they might, in fact, be leaders of worship yeah. in, in bad worship. Yeah. So they have a reason to be, you know, throwing insults at Elisha. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of speculation in terms of how old they are. Some were saying that maybe it's their parents that influence them. Mm-hmm. I think it could be the elders of the city saying, hey, go out and give that guy hassle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, could be. Yeah. be. But no matter what, they saw him as a threat. And that is inferred in their ridicule of him when they said, uh, go up, go up, you baldy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I've always read that and wondered, why is that such an insult? Like, get 
go up, bald head, go up, bald head, if you're going right back to the new King James or even the old King James. Yeah. And um, I didn't understand it, but now I do. Uh, go up was inferring, um, we want you to go to heaven like Elijah did. And and in essence, mm. it's a, it's an insult, but it's also a um, like a get out of here kind of uh, cry. But what they're saying is, we're glad he's gone, and we wish that you would follow him. Yeah. Get out of here, leave us alone, and stop trying to tell us about our sin. Stop trying to be a spiritual influence in our city. We're happy with our gods. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, they they being the type of worshipers they were of not the true worship, mm-hmm. not the true God, they were seeing Elijah, his, you know— his the Jedi, whatever, Master. yeah, <laughs> as as a false prophet, and also him, yeah, and um, they they were also throwing with the word baldy. I don't know if you ran across mm-hmm. this, Josh. Are you ready to go there? Go ahead. Yeah, I've got some. Yeah, just I, I saw it. it was interesting that the fact that they they said baldy. Um, Elijah was known as a hairy man. <laughs> and so to say baldy, it's like, not only are you not real, but you're lesser than your predecessor, you know? Yeah. So it was just an insult all around. And it's mm-hmm. kind of centered around our worship is right. Yours is wrong. It's a, it's a, an attack yeah. on God's people almost. Yeah. Or, or a God, God's people's prophet. Okay. So I totally agree. Um, weighing on this as a man who still has more hair on his head than he has uh, runway room. Uh, <laughs> I've got the monkey butt, but I don't have the cul-de-sac just yet. Uh, <laughs> this term bald head for a young person of any age to call a grown man bald head would be an extreme insult and to repeat the nickname would make the offense even worse. Gray hair to Jews was considered a crown of glory while a bald head could be considered a disgrace. Um, and now this is another inaccuracy that I quoted from my mind movie. Elisha, who I assumed was older, was a relatively young man. He, in fact, lived 50 years after this encounter. So he may have had uh, one natural hair loss. Could mm. be. There was no Rogaine for men. <laughs> <laughs> Biblical times. Uh, number two. A shaved head representative of his office as a prophet, or more likely, number three, a sign of scorn and contempt where he wasn't actually even bald. They were just using it as uh, a fiery insult. He might not have actually been bald. They were just saying like, um, like you're a doo-doo head, you know, yeah. I, that's the first thing I could think of. <laughs> like you're stupid. <laughs> just a flat out doesn't make sense. We're just insulting you. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just think of, like you said, to think of the comparison and contrast of the master and the paddle on walking along. And let's say that for, um, illustration sake, Elisha was bald. Yeah. How weird it would it have been for Elijah to walk around as this hairy beast Chewbacca kind of prophet <laughs> and then his guy never next to him like you know yeah <laughs> lex luthering <laughs> snake and bird <laughs> <laughs> yeah one great. one has some feathers and one does not and <laughs> so um okay right here he pronounces a curse and uh this is my favorite line that we can say as a callback to some of our other shows bringest thou a curse <laughs> because he really actually does yes um elisha called upon the Lord to deal with the rebels as he saw fit. And I thought this was interesting because there's a few different Hebrew verbs for curse, three that I found specifically. And this word that he uses right here in this passage is not the strongest one. So a curse is defined as the use of powerful words to invoke supernatural harm. Uh, The word he used right here is kalal. Uh, It's used 83 times in 79 verses, 39 in reference to a curse. But this is one of those Hebrew, I call it utility words, because another uh, meaning that this word could have is to make light of, to bring into contempt. This is not your typical, you'll rue the day you insulted me word. Yeah. It was more of like, God, you deal with them how you want to. Okay. So it wasn't like looking at Stephen and being like, I curse, you know what I mean? Even though the end result was that. (laughs) Yes. Well, let's talk about that. Or was it? Was it? Okay. (laughs) Because um, that moves me right along to my next point. Here's a fascinating angle of this story that I've never considered. 
Uh, you can tell from my understanding that I thought all of the 42 young men died, okay. right? Yeah, that's what it appears to be. Well, what if, in fact, none of them did? Now, I I'm know listening. that's extra biblical, and we don't want to add to Scripture or the Word, but guess what? Thinking that they died is also adding to the Word as well. All right, let's hear it. Lay it out for us. Okay. So the Hebrew word that the Bible uses when referring to our she bears, which I love that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, mauling these young men is beka. Okay. I hopefully I said that right. Um, what that word means, and I thought this was cool. It's uh, Strong's one, two, three, four, my favorite number. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> that reminds me of Spaceballs. How'd you know my luggage code? <laughs> <laughs> um, Baka means to cleave open, to rip, to cut up, to tear into, to rend, uh, or basically their favorite donuts were bear claws. So that's, and that's the word nice. <laughs> okay, so I was sitting there going right into a question yeah, no. and I missed it. So, so that was the word for maul. Yes, which to, that that's pretty translatable to now because maul doesn't mean kill now. Mm -hmm. It could be torn up to rend, not yeah. necessarily killed. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, multiple commentators support this line of thinking. Uh, there's a commentary uh, called McClintock and Strong. It says it is by no means certain that any or all of them were killed. Warren Wearsby says this. These young men were not showing respect to the Lord God of Israel, to Elijah, or to Elisha. So, in this particular instance, they were judged. The two bears mauled the youths, but didn't kill them. And for the rest of their days, their scars reminded everybody that they couldn't trifle with the Lord and get away with it. Mm. It doesn't say if any of the 42 young men died, but I would say that this account would be even more miraculous if every single one of them lived. That's something to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Because when you tear it down like that, I mean, it, it could. It could go either way. Yeah. Okay. You know how this goes. Yeah. I get a wild hair, and next thing I know, I'm quoting Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> <laughs> because, I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this reminded um, of this concept of them getting mauled and not dying, but bearing the scars reminded me of one of my favorite book series, the Chronicles of Narnia. In a criminally underrated book number six, The Horse and His Boy, uh, there's a story where one of the main characters is a rich girl who lied about what she was doing, and she ends up getting her servant whipped for her deception. Later, Aslan, who represents Jesus in the whole story, the whole Chronicles, allows her back to get scratched by lion's claws. And when she visits a healer, the healer that dresses her wounds marvels that the claws didn't dig into her back nearly as significantly as they could have. Later on, she learns that she received her, quote, lashes for the lies she told about the servant girl. So this might be a stretch of a correlation, but she was never going to forget the lesson that she learned from those scars. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean... It, but again, this is one of those things where I inferred that every one of these children, and again, I'm using quotes, yeah. died. Yeah. But now we know, first and foremost, they weren't children. Yeah. And second, they they might not have died. I don't know what kind of, how um, serious their wounds they received yeah. were. Well, and that's that's why we talk about these things like this, these weird spots, because like in the last episode, it, all the commentators seem to say one thing mm -hmm. when it could have been the other, and here, vice versa, yeah, could have all of them, pretty much every sermon I've ever heard and most commentaries <laughs> yeah. say they all die. Me too. But we don't know that. Which is crazy because, again, I'm coming at this from having gone to Bible college. Yeah. I've taught this passage to youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is something that until we did this study particularly, I've always read that and had a queasy feeling in my stomach about 42 youths getting eaten by yes. two bears. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> what's that old uh, show that had the boy and the bear, Gentle Ben? And there's a comedian <laughs> named Brian Regan who's like, no, he just went for more honey and he's picking his teeth <laughs> yeah. with 
like his the little boy's bones and it's just like oh that's so creepy <laughs> yeah no i'm with you you know because i think every christian that's read this story come across it has, has had a queasy feeling because it's there's a lot that seems wrong uh-huh. but when we did this study it, i i walked away with a lot more peace knowing you know several different things one of which being that these weren't children yes they very oh, well yeah. could have been like priests of a pagan religion yes throwing like almost like these insults of uh, of an atmosphere of you might get stoned right now or something yeah, yeah. so it, it, it was a much dire situation than a bear mauling little kids exactly so yeah when i think of child i think of an eight-year-old a 10-year-old a 12-year-old mm-hmm. who doesn't have at that point the conscious thought of knowing right from wrong yeah these guys it seemed like they actually had made their decision yes and i want to point out too that one commentator talks about the size of the crowd uh his name is russell dilday he noted that since 42 of the boys were struck by the bears this group may have been quite large and therefore dangerously out of control Mm -hmm. i mean at this point elijah may have needed miraculous intervention just to escape from the mob that these bears had to come out and do what they did and that's precisely what might have happened Mm -hmm. is the miraculous intervention yeah because I mean, we all know, especially in our current climate, crowds can be a b- very fickle thing. Mm-hmm. They can turn on a dime yeah. to bad real quick. Exactly. And so yeah, that's a good point. This very well could have been God interacting because mm-hmm. of what might have been fixing to happen. Yeah. And I wanted to point out this. This was interesting. Um, so we've talked about Nadab and Abihu. We've talked about um, a few different things. We talked about Uzzah touching the ark. But uh, one commentator pointed out throughout the word at the beginning of a new phase or work that God is doing, there's a lot of times where we can point to a form of uh, judgment or a warning that's issued by God to show how seriously he takes this new thing he's doing. Yes. Uh, Throughout scripture, we can, like I said, Nadab and Abihu, when they were burning profane fire, the Lord struck them and they died. Yeah. Then there's another instance where uh, the children of Israel had just crossed the Jordan River And they're going to go take over Jericho. And God said, listen, this first city is mine. Mm -hmm. Everything else you can have. But then there's this guy named Achan who saw something and he's like, my wife needs that. And so he took it and ends up his sin found him out and he ended up getting judged and died. Was that that the battle of AI that I'm thinking of? Yeah. They went to go conquer AI and they got destroyed even yeah. though it was a lesser army and God was like, there's sin in the camp. You know what I always think of when I read that story is when the football coach made us all run when one person threw trash. <laughs> that is, it's like, this is how serious this is. You all are we'll going to understand why this is serious. That's funny. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Uh, and threw trash like the ball. <laughs> no. It was the water boy. <laughs> Not fair. (laughs) Um, Another instance is you have Uzzah who touched the Ark. They were supposed to transport the Ark of the Covenant on poles. Instead, they used a cart and the cart started to tip. And he was like, no, not the Ark. And he touched it and he wasn't supposed to. And God struck him and he died. And then you've got um, Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit. That was another new uh, chapter, new work that he was doing. And Peter was like, you've lied to God. Yeah. Dead. Mm-hmm. So this, somebody pointed out that this could be because we just talked about how the new bowl, the salt being thrown into the water, was uh, instituting Elisha taking over Elijah's ministry and God doing a new thing through him, that this could have been one of those instances of saying, this is how seriously I take um, my prophets. And uh, the moral of the story is don't insult God or his messenger. He won't be mocked either. Yeah. You know, no, that's a fantastic uh, way you just laid out all that out. And I I instantly want to just jump on board with that because that's, that makes perfect sense to me because we do see in every one of those instances, he does a new thing Mm -hmm. and he might do something so drastic to, to burn it in your memories. And it might not happen every time. Cause we know like with Ananias and Sapphira, people don't drop down dead when they lie and do bad things with money, financial, and lie and stuff. We mm-hmm. see with televangelists and stuff. So, yeah, he it's something with a new thing. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Why could we point to this one instance of this? Yeah, say this is God always. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, so if it's okay with you, I'd like to retell my new mind movie yeah. <laughs> with my inaccuracies fixed. Switch uh, directors here. Yeah, please please note, I've taken some, still taken some artistic liberties. <laughs> <laughs> Just because it's a movie, okay? <laughs> so, Elisha, newly separated from his teacher Elijah, and now one of the premier prophets of God in the nation of Israel slash Judah, heads to the idolatrous city of Bethel. Possibly to share a message from God about repenting and turning away from false gods. As he nears the city, a large group of late teens or young adult men see the man of God coming at them, armed with the rumor that their previous prophetic tormentor, Elijah, has left the region by ascension, and the obvious glaring fact that his young Padawan has a shiny dome, they begin to jeer and cackle at him, trying to get under his skin, chanting for him to follow his master's floaty ways and like most bullies picking on the low-hanging fruit of mocking his no hawk hairdo after this goes on for some time elisha scans the crowd of these lost young men and mumbles to himself is this a monday come on dudes god are you seeing this they're not bothering me, just a nuisance. Right then, careening from the tree line, come two wild-eyed female bears intent on playing touch tag with as many of these young men as they can get their paws on. In the end, it's 42 of them covered in claw marks and scratches, heading back to their heathen hospital, praying to their false idols for healing and protection. Man, they don't like that Elisha guy. Meanwhile, Elisha looks to heaven and says, Thank you, God. You're my protection. <laughs> nice. Deuce. <laughs> Deuces. Oh, man. Re reworked. Reworked. Yeah. I like it. It still has the assumption that maybe they didn't die and all those things. And yeah. Maybe his curse wasn't as much of a pronouncement upon them as it was just going, God, here they are. They're, they're showing contempt for me. And, you know, I just, I thought it was an interesting way to retell it because from now on, moving forward, this is the way I want to see this story in my mind, um, having more Hebrew context of what the words mean yes, and an understanding of why this story is told and not um, allowing the world to look at God and be like, well, is that the God you serve? Yeah. And pointing to this story as a black eye for him. Yeah. And you could say, hey, actually, I've studied this. Let's, let's sit down and have a talk. <laughs> yeah. Because, and that's the, that's the danger of just skimming over God's word and not mm -hmm. letting it read you, is you don't get the meat of it. You mm -hmm. don't get the real context of it if you just skim it and you make these assumptions. Yeah. So that's why I love this uh, new weird in the word that we're doing. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. I'm so excited that we have this format to be able to dig into stuff like this and give it some contextualization. Absolutely. Yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Because <laughs> I, I did. I learned a few things. Oh, me too. I really did. Studying for this, I was like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, no doubt. And I hope that you get as excited as we do as we discover these n nuggets of gold that we didn't even realize some of them before we started studying. Well, I, I hope that you have some ideas that you can shoot our way too. If you have stories like this in the scripture that you've never really understood or whatever, shoot them our way. Show us your weird. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we would love to hear about that and we would love to dig into it. Yeah, if you can and you want to weigh in on something that we should talk about or uh, you want to point out something that maybe we've missed whatever it is contact us you can reach us through facebook you can send us a facebook message or you can even email us at connect at basnakebird.com we want to hear from you yeah we really do and we thank you guys who have faithfully listened to us we see you out there mm -hmm. uh, we don't overlook you and we're very grateful for you and I uh, would pray that if, if this is this podcast is doing well for you, if, if you're growing in it, uh, share it with somebody. Um, let them experience some of the stuff you've learned in the, in the podcast. And we just really appreciate you sharing us. Uh, give us a review. That'll help us, too, if you don't mind. Yeah, and don't forget, all of our videos are being uploaded to YouTube the day that they're being uploaded on whatever podcast you're listening to. So if you want an audio version, just that you can play on your computer or your phone or wherever you consume yeah. your tube, <laughs> uh, find us there as well and subscribe, please. Ring that bell. That's what they always say. Yeah. <laughs> so, snake birds, always remember whatever you do. Wherever 
wherever you go. No matter what the bears throw at you. <laughs> There's never been a better time not to mock a prophet. That's right. And be, be a, a snake, snake bird. bird.